This fragile reel of tape contains the voice of one of the most feared men in history. Everyone knows his name. This is a fragment of the only existing tape recording of Adolf Hitler speaking privately, not as a screaming actor on the world stage, but as a human being, using the full power of his personality, trying to bend others to his will. This recording is an extraordinary window into the mind and madness of one of history's most terrifying figures. This is the Adolf Hitler we think we know. But this is just a caricature, images culled from the Nazi propaganda machine. But there was another hidden Adolf Hitler, a soft-spoken, almost charming conversationalist. During his reign of terror, Hitler let his guard down only once. When his voice was captured not on stage, but behind closed doors. And so came this verzögerung. I ich im Jahre 39 when I heard the tape for the first time, it became much more clear to me why other politicians had, for some time at least, believed in Hitler's words. This tape was recorded in a private train car in Finland on June 4th, 1942. The man to whom Hitler was speaking was Marshal Karl Gustav Mannerheim commander-in-chief of the Finnish Armed Forces. The Finnish recording is the only one of its kind. I think it is a key to understand the way how Hitler dealt with his partners, his style, the way he tries to seduce Mannerheim, to convince him. Gustav Mannerheim is still revered in Finland. He led Finland in their fight for independence from Russia in 1917. And during the Second World War, Mannerheim fought against two of the 20th century's most lethal regimes. As a token of a nation's continuing esteem, his personal train has been preserved as a museum. Inside a private room in this car, radio technician Tor Domain recorded over 11 minutes of Hitler speaking privately with Mannerheim. Today, this extraordinary recording lies hidden in the sound archives of the Finnish National Broadcasting Company in Helsinki. Within this archive, 300,000 tapes are stored, but this tape is like no other. I have said always that uh, this tape is the most valuable tape in our archive because it is the only tape in the world where Hitler speaks freely. Adolf Hitler was defined by his public image, and that image was carefully manufactured by the Nazis. The Nazis turned propaganda into a fine art and a deadly weapon, a terrifying but persuasive lie that millions believe. The leading player in all of this was Adolf Hitler. Hitler's image was complex. He needed the Germans to believe in him, to love him, and to fear him. He accumulated absolute power by developing a pseudo-religious mystical cult of personality. Hitler could act well enough, his acting style and so, but he was put there by the masses. If he had spoken like a priest, no one would have listened. Hitler adapted his image to each situation. Here, addressing Parliament, he spoke diplomatically, playing the intelligent statesman. 
Here with industrialists, he spoke and dressed like a businessman. When Hitler addressed Nazi party meetings, playing the rabble-rouser, his tone is unmistakably violent. The pictures you can see made of Hitler in the papers and books are censored. For instance, you will never see Hitler with his hands in his pockets. Hitler with his hands in his pockets might appear relaxed, and that was precisely the image he did not want to project. Hitler's public image wasn't only built up by the propaganda machine, it was also refined and distilled, stripped down to the bare essentials. In Germany there was a strict censorship, especially with everything dealing with the Führer, the leader himself. Photographs, as well as interviews, were strictly controlled. Hitler's public image presented him as a superman, endowed with godlike powers. Here in the film Triumph of the Will, the message is clear. Hitler is descending from the heavens like a deity. This deity had no time for friendship or family, no time to even drink alcohol. He devoted his life to the power and resurgent glory of the new Germany. Throughout all the propaganda, Hitler's image is that of a solitary man standing in the eye of a hurricane of hate that he himself had created. He was a consummate actor, always aware that the eyes of a mass audience were upon him. And in front of that audience, he could be whoever he wanted to be. Today, his speeches have been excerpted and edited in ways that obliterate their original meaning. But when Hitler is allowed to speak within the original context, his power of persuasion is unmistakable. For example, in April 1939, Hitler was at the height of his power and popularity in Germany. He had executed a series of conquests without bloodshed, occupying Austria and part of Czechoslovakia. His new order was on the march, and nobody knew just how far Hitler was prepared to go. It was almost five months before the war started, and almost two years before the attack on Pearl Harbor. The United States was still neutral, and President Roosevelt was trying to head off a war he saw on the horizon. Roosevelt sends Hitler a telegram of concern, listing the countries he thought Hitler was targeting. Hitler replies in one of his best public performances, a twisted, stand-up comic routine. Herr Roosevelt verlangt endlich die Bereitwilligkeit, ihm die Zusicherung zu geben, dass die deutschen Streitkräfte das Staatsgebiet oder die Besitzungen folgender unabhängiger unabhängiger Nationen nicht angreifen und vor allem nicht dort einmarschieren würden. Und er nennt als dafür in Frage kommend nun Finnland, Lettland, Litauen, Estland, Norwegen, Schweden, Dänemark, Niederlande, Belgien, Großbritannien, Irland, Frankreich, Portugal, Spanien, die Schweiz, Liechtenstein, Luxemburg, Polen, Ungarn, Rumänien, Jugoslawien, Russland, Bulgarien, Türkei, Irak, Arabien, Syrien, Palästina, Ägypten. Hitler would, of course, invade more than half of the countries on Roosevelt's list. But lying came easily to Adolf Hitler. And he was one of the first modern politicians to truly understand the awesome power and influence of the media. He and his advisors micromanaged every public appearance. He played a role. It was different roles, as we know, meanwhile. Uh, but performance was part of his nature. And that makes this tape so extraordinary. Not just because someone managed to record it, but because of the way Hitler sounds. Charming, relaxed, perhaps most shockingly, completely reasonable. This is nothing like the Hitler we think we know. So much so that some believe this recording is a forgery. Sometimes it feels okay, but at other points not. I have the feeling it's someone mimicking Hitler. Could this carefully modulated voice really be that of Adolf Hitler? 
Dr. Stefan Grafer, head of forensic speech analysis at the Bundeskriminalamt, the German FBI, will help unravel this mystery. Is it Hitler's voice in this short sample we have, or is it somebody mimicking him? And if this really is the private Hitler, what was he saying? 35,000 Panzer. Wir haben über, wir haben zur Zeit über 34,000 Panzer vernichtet. Did he divulge secrets that might rewrite the history of World War II? The investigation continues. Und wenn man ein General von mir erklärt hätte, dass hier im Staat 35,000 Panzer in dieser Ziege halten sie alles doppelt oder zehnfach. Das ist Wahnsinn, das ist ein Gespenster. This unique recording of Adolf Hitler speaking privately captures a side of Hitler never before heard. For this reason, some believe it may be a hoax. Das war schon im, 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 im Herbst 1940 für uns ununterbrochen die Frage, soll man äh, es auf einen Bruch ankommen lassen? It really sounds as if someone is mimicking him. The truth is in the details. Hitler's sworn enemy. Hitler's sworn enemy, the Soviet Union, had invaded and occupied part of Finland in November 1939. Nearly two years later, after Hitler invaded Russia, unoccupied Finland used the opportunity to attack Russia and reclaim its lost territory. One year later, Adolf Hitler decided to travel to Finland for the first time to meet face to face with Finnish Field Marshal Gustav Mannerheim. He prepared this visit uh, several weeks before his trip to Finland, but he kept his plans in total secrecy. And one day before, this means the 3rd of June 1942, he gave some information to Mannerheim himself that he will come next day. He wanted to keep uh, the trip secret. June 4th was Mannerheim's birthday, and Hitler planned on attending. Mannerheim's birthdays had once been cause for public celebration, but now because of the war, they were celebrated in secret. And this was no party. It was a strategic necessity. Mannerheim and Finland were trapped between two tyrants, hoping one would destroy the other. Der Führer verlässt das Hauptquartier des Generalfeldmarschall von Bock. In June 1942, Hitler was unquestionably the most powerful man on the planet. He had devastated the Soviet Union, and just six months after Pearl Harbor, the United States was only beginning to recover. Hitler's war was going well, but not well enough. And this was no birthday celebration. Well, I think the moment for Hitler's visit to Finland was chosen very cleverly. On the one hand, it was a, in the broader context of grand strategy. Hitler's lightning war, his blitzkrieg, had bogged down in the Soviet Union. He needed the Finns to fight by his side, to tie down as much of the massive Soviet army as possible. Hitler understood the meeting with Mannerheim very much as the meeting of two soldiers. He wished to meet him as a comrade, as a comrade in arms. Hitler's day began here, in East Prussia. Today it is an overgrown forest. In the summer of 1942, these ruined bunkers housed the command center of the Nazi military state. This was the infamous Wolf's Lair. Hitler usually stays up very late and likes to sleep until noon. But on the morning of June 4th, Adolf Hitler has an appointment to keep. At 8.35 a.m., his private plane, a converted Falkwolf 200 Condor bomber, rolls onto this airstrip and prepares to take off. But there is a problem. The brakes are jammed, a sometimes lethal design flaw of the Condor. These brake drums could catch fire on takeoff, and when the wheels are retracted, the burning tires could be lying directly under the fuel tanks. The problem is fixed and Hitler takes off. 
The security arrangements for Hitler's flight were intense. All along his flight path, anti-aircraft guns were ready to repel any threat from the air. In the Baltic Sea, Finnish and German boats patrolled, ready to fight or ready to rescue. Nothing was left to chance. This Nazi newsreel documented the historic visit, and the making of this newsreel shows just how carefully Hitler's public image was controlled. Here, as Finland's President Riti greets Hitler, two men carrying equipment run into frame and out again. Two seconds later, two Finnish cameramen enter. What this edited film cleverly conceals is that when Hitler landed in Finland, his plane narrowly missed hitting a factory chimney, breaking so hard on landing that one wheel caught fire. But the Finnish camera crew captured the burning tire, a tire blazing immediately below the fuel tanks. The German cameraman knowing that Hitler was in a perilous situation, starts filming as Hitler climbs down through the smoke. This arrival sequence is later rescued in the cutting room. These extras are not carrying cameras. They are carrying fire extinguishers. This is just one example of how Hitler's image was manipulated. How nothing would compromise what today would be called a photo op. Hitler has to see and smell smoke from this burning rubber, but he pretends it isn't happening. He maintains his focus on his image and While these official greetings were being filmed at the airfield, sound engineer Tor Domain set up microphones inside Mannerheim's special train. In the dining car, Hitler was to record a short speech for public consumption in Finland. They prepared the uh, train. They put uh, several microphones in the restaurant wagon where Marshal Mannerheim received the guests. Domain had positioned two microphones between the luggage racks over Mannerheim's table in the dining car. The cable ran outside to where Domain had set up his recording equipment, two state-of-the-art reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. They wired these microphones securely to fit the space, hiding them in birch leaves so they were nearly invisible. At this table, they served Hitler his own special meal, a food taster having made sure the dish was not poisoned. The official speeches were recorded in the dining car, but the true affairs of state would be discussed in the privacy of Mannerheim's personal salon car. The public speech was recorded as planned, and then the men adjourned for a more personal meeting. As the men walked across the plank to the salon car, Demain hastily moved his microphones to the new location. He wanted to be prepared in case any more official remarks needed to be recorded. Hitler began a casual but secret conversation with Mannerheim. It was time for his real work, his personal persuasion, to begin. But outside, Tor Domain makes a momentous decision. Having set up his microphones, he decides to keep recording the now private conversation. Henrik Domain is Tor's son. The story of how this recording was made has become family legend, beginning with the secret installation of the microphones. Since my father was responsible for the recording there, so he, he found out that he couldn't record. The microphones were in the wrong car, so he took a microphone and went to the salon wagon which had a window open, and he threw the microphone up to the baggage compartment. When jemand gesagt hätte, dass ein Staat mit Tanks antreten kann, he thought that he will make a good service for his uh, army and his uh, fatherland. Tordemain put himself in mortal danger. 
The SS men guarding Hitler were trained to shoot first and ask questions later. Putting on his headphones, Demain began to listen to the most significant sound recording of his life. But after 11 minutes, Hitler's guards realized what Tor Demain was doing. A German officer noticed and he demanded to stop immediately to record the conversation. One of the German guards pointed a finger at Demain and made a cutting gesture across his throat. Incredibly, the Germans didn't shoot. And though they were furious, they didn't even confiscate the tape. And said, if this had happened uh, in Germany, you have cut your head off. Apparently, the recording was saved because the SS guards didn't dare tarnish Hitler's media event. As shooting a Finn for spying, or destroying Finnish radio property would have caused a major diplomatic conflict with one of Germany's most vital allies. The guards had to find a compromise. They ordered the tape to be sealed, never to be opened. These broken wax seals are still on the tape box. Afterwards, uh, naturally, the Finns uh, opened the boxes and listened it what Hitler has told to Mannerheim. Then, the tape vanished into history. June 4th, 1942. Adolf Hitler had turned Europe into a slaughterhouse. On this day, Hitler's final solution is exterminating thousands of Jews at the newly constructed death camps at Sobibor, Treblinka, and Belchis. But 700 miles away in Finland, the architect of this Holocaust was enjoying a friendly lunch, speaking candidly to Finland's leader Gustav Mannerheim about how his war is going. This 11-minute conversation was captured by Finnish radio technician Tor Demain. Those who have heard it believe it provides an extraordinary perspective of the private Adolf Hitler. The Hitler who seduced a nation. But to, but to one man, this tape is no historical treasure, it is a fraud. He is speaking normally, but I have problems with the tone. The intonation isn't quite right. Rokas Misch was at Hitler's beck and call from 1940 to the dictator's suicide in 1945. And Misch was also Hitler's private switchboard operator. If anyone still living knows Hitler, it is Misch. For as Hitler's private operator, he could distinguish Hitler's voice from all the other Nazi leaders. Sometimes it seems okay, but at other points not. I have the feeling it's someone mimicking Hitler. Well, if Misch finds this voice pleasant, uh, this is not surprising to me because I guess that his experience with Hitler's voice was in a totally different setting. In order to definitively prove that this is Hitler's voice, we asked audio analyst Stefan Gruffer to compare this tape with the other Hitler recording made a few minutes earlier on the same microphone. We spliced together segments of speech from the two different recordings. And we usually do this in order to, to listen if, if there is a sudden change in verbal behavior or in the, how the voice sounds. And uh, what we find here is that it's, it stays exactly the same. So it's, it's obvious for us that it is one voice. Our analysis leaves no doubt. This is Adolf Hitler. 
As close as Rokas Mish was to Hitler, he was not close enough to ever hear this voice. People are surprised at how pleasant he seems. But what can account for this relaxed, almost charming, low-key voice? There might be a very unscientific explanation. Hitler may have been drinking alcohol at lunch. I do know he would drink Fene Branca before addressing a big gathering. He drank a digestive spirit. Contrary to the Nazi propaganda legend that always portrayed him as being disciplined and sober. In fact, Hitler seems to have a glass of some spirit in front of him here with Mannerheim. And I saw him drinking beer, traveling in the train, in the restaurant car. I was eating there and I saw him drinking a beer, a Holzkirchnerbräu. This extraordinary series of photographs of the meeting, taken by a Finnish military photographer, also reveals a discrepancy in the Domain family legend of a secretly placed microphone. The microphones were in the wrong car, so he took a microphone and went to the salon wagon which had a window open and he threw the microphone up to the baggage compartment. There's no microphone on this picture, where it's obvious this is the conversation between Mannerheim and, and Hitler. On this picture there's also a microphone that is obviously visible and not uh, hidden at all. So if this is the same room where the conversation was recorded, then the microphone was obviously not hidden. Tor de Main's microphone was plainly visible. Hitler could not have missed it. But no one told him the tape was still rolling. And what it captured is extraordinary. The secret tape shows that he has a broader spectrum of behavior, of performances, than one would expect. You couldn't distinguish him from any serious statesman in the world when listening to the tape. Armed with this new evidence, we can now go back in time to 1942 and hear a different side of World War II, directly from the mouth of the man who started it. This is the only existing recording of how Adolf Hitler presented himself behind closed doors. Hitler was caught speaking candidly with Finnish military leader Karl Mannerheim as part of a carefully choreographed ballet of deception. The conversation seems pleasant, one friend to another. But what did Mannerheim really feel about Hitler? Raw footage taken that same day provides some clues. Here, Hitler is clearly putting on a show but Mannerheim listens skeptically. He seems bored, politely hiding his irritation. Here, Hitler presents Mannerheim with a gift of two armored staff cars. But as soon as Mannerheim breaks eye contact with Hitler, he looks irritated. But alone with his Finnish soldiers and politicians, Mannerheim is very relaxed treating his comrades with affection. But here, his expression conveys dislike and distrust of Hitler. While the cameras recorded Hitler crossing the plank to Mannerheim's train, a Finnish photographer caught a candid image. As Hitler almost clowns on the gangplank, in the background, Mannerheim smiles his expression enigmatic, a symbol of a tense relationship strained by the Finns' adamant refusal to directly cooperate in any way with Hitler's Holocaust. Finland had even saved the lives of thousands of foreign Jewish refugees by moving them over their border to neutral Sweden. There were Jewish soldiers in the Finnish army, a very tragic situation of soldiers fighting along the Germans for a cause of which they didn't know what would come out and it would be a tragedy, uh, especially to the Jewish soldiers, whether they would win or lose. But for the moment at least, Hitler needed Finland 
as much as Finland temporarily needed Germany. Hitler's main purpose in making his visit to Finland was to convince the Finns to remain on Germany's side. And in order to do that, he had, first of all, to explain the German failures of the last winter. Adolf Hitler was about to be trapped by his own words as he unwittingly reveals his true and sinister intentions. The discussion on the tape centers on the Soviet Union. On it, Hitler confesses that he underestimated their strength when he attacked in June of 1941. Mannerheim agreed. He had already fought the Red Army in the 1939 Winter War and had tested the Russian strength. Here, Hitler talks like a businessman who has underestimated his competitors. Hitler tried to appear serious to Mannerheim, to give the impression of a competent leader whom you could trust. But for Hitler, trust is just another weapon in his arsenal of deceit. Listen now to how he imparts a sense of shock and amazement at the Russian strength, but only to bolster his own credibility. Heute ist dort eine Panzerfabrik, die in der, in der ersten Schicht der etwas über 30.000 und in den Vollausbau über 60.000 Arbeiter beschäftigt sind. Eine einzige Panzerfabrik. Wir, sind, wir haben sie besetzt. Eine, eine gigantische Fabrik. One single tank factory, we occupied it, a gigantic tank factory. So he uses a lot of modulation to show that even he was impressed by this size. Wir haben sie besetzt. On the tape, Hitler dramatizes his ignorance of Russian strength, at the same time brushing it aside to emphasize his own power. Mannerheim seems to agree. This is the last time we hear Mannerheim speaking on the tape. From this point on, Hitler talks in an uninterrupted monologue. Now Hitler the actor takes over. Listen to how he makes himself sound weak and vulnerable. <laughs> Treaties only served to buy Hitler time. Even before the Hitler-Stalin pact was signed, he was planning to attack Soviet Russia. But first, he needed to conquer France, an invasion successfully concluded by the summer of 1940. On the tape, he reveals that he wanted to invade six months earlier. Hitler then speaks about late 1939, the period when Stalin attacked Finland, and Hitler was planning to attack France, the first major step on the road to subjugating Europe. Hitler is boasting, and his hubris is audible. He wanted to attack under all conditions, so this is very strong. 
Hitler's blitzkrieg tactics depended on all conditions being favorable. Hitler had invaded France once before as a soldier in World War I. Hitler did not shrink from telling the truth about his conquest of France, a nation which had wanted to help the Finns in 1939. It is not surprising that Karl Mannerheim, an officer and a gentleman, had fallen silent. I could not begin September or October with our weapons. It was impossible. Soon the conversation would turn to a matter of life and death for both men. War with the Soviet Union. A war that, shockingly, Hitler claims he did not want. Is it possible that Adolf Hitler sincerely wanted peace, not war? June 4, 1942. For Hitler, seduction was just as effective a weapon as threats. He mainly left the bullying and threatening to his SS and Gestapo underlings. He was a good speaker. He could inspire people with his style of speaking. That was his strength, too. It was also his strength when he faced his admirals and generals. He could assert himself, even when they didn't agree with him. Our analysis concludes that the tape is genuine. But how genuine was Hitler? In his cold-blooded calculus, one of the reasons he invaded Russia was simply to ensure access to nearby Romanian oil. In war, Access to raw materials can mean the difference between victory and defeat. Hitler had positioned an army of 200,000 German soldiers in northern Scandinavia to secure the vital nickel mines there. But the tape reveals that Hitler suspected that Stalin was eyeing the Romanian oil fields to the south. But Hitler couldn't stop now. By attacking Russia, Hitler had placed the German Reich in a fight to the death. When Germany attacked the Soviet Union, they decided to sell this attack as a preventive war, which could be seen as a moral justification for the attack. Hitler didn't attack Russia because he thought Stalin was threatening Germany. Hitler attacked because he thought Stalin was weak. It would be a fatal miscalculation. Germany's overall situation in the summer of 1942 was pretty desperate. Hitler was masterful at playing the victim. Every war he began was presented as an act of self-defense. The invasion of Russia was no different. <laughs> Now, Hitler casually circles back to the subject that had brought him to Mannerheim, Finland. This is the heart of the conversation, where Hitler has to persuade Mannerheim that he has always looked out for Finland's welfare. Even Hitler knew full well that was a lie. Back in 1939, during the brief period when Hitler and Stalin were allies, Soviet Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov had been keen to stake the Soviet claim to the Finnish territories. 
erst bei dem Besuch von Bologov, das hat ja noch quasi vier, vier Punkte, der eine Punkt, der Finnland betraf, der die Freiheit sich vor den finnischen Drohungen zu schützen, sagt er, dann wird er den Eindruck, dass Finnland sie bedroht. In this part of the recording where he's uh, telling the story about his conversation with Molotov, he's not just telling what happened and not describing the situation, he's really acting it out. Maybe in order to be more credible. Hitler seems to be trying to deceive Mannerheim by saying he had warned Molotov that Germany would intervene if Russia were to attack Finland. Because at exactly this time, the fall of 1939, Hitler was making his unholy pact with Stalin. The Hitler-Stalin pact had a secret clause that gave Finland to Stalin. This was the real reason why Hitler had not helped Finland when the Soviets attacked them in 1939. But the Finns knew nothing of this agreement. They simply couldn't understand why the Germans, who, in their perception, had always taken part in favor of Finnish independence, now uh, remained passive. Hitler is performing at his best. Although he had handed Stalin Finland on a platter, he is acting as if he were the great defender of the Finns. As Hitler returned to the airstrip to fly home, he may have already known that he had failed in his mission. He had not convinced Mannerheim that Germany was a reliable ally. Hitler's war would grind on, and as the tide turned against Germany, so too would Finland. The reality of Hitler's attempted seduction of Mannerheim was finally made clear when he turned on the man whose birthday he had just celebrated. Two years after this meeting, the Finns declared war on Germany and signed a peace treaty with the Soviet Union. The betrayed Finns had turned on their German betrayer. Hitler then dropped all pretense. He wanted revenge, and he ordered a scorched earth policy. Retreating German forces destroyed more than a third of all dwellings in Finnish Lapland. They burned entire cities to the ground, and they left the territory booby-trapped with mines. Ultimately, Hitler reveals his true character to the Finns, a character revealed by his actions, not his words. Having heard uh, Hitler speak the way he did with Mannerheim, it is easier to understand why others could believe him. He is convincing in the way he speaks, at least for those who wished to believe him. It is shockingly easy to forget who you are listening to in this recording. The banality of evil has never been so apparent. When Hitler casually refers to the Soviet factory workers as animals, the consequences of this attitude would be the demise of literally millions of Soviet prisoners, worked and starved to death. When Hitler reflects upon invading France in 1939, rather than six months earlier, it is as if the horror and devastation brought by the Nazis was just a minor consequence. And looming over this conversation, like a malicious black cloud, is the Holocaust which will forever define Adolf Hitler and his brutal brand of evil. At 10 past six, the evil manipulator's work was over. Hitler said his farewells to Mannerheim and boarded his plane for the return flight. At exactly that moment, 6,000 miles away in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, one of the pivotal battles of the Second World War was beginning. American forces were engaging Japanese aircraft carriers in the Battle of Midway. The Japanese fleet would never recover. The tide of the war in the Pacific was turning. But as he flew home, Hitler knew nothing of the losses his number one ally had suffered.
This accordion music signals the moment when Tor Domain stopped his machine. The tape had been used once before to record a concert. But fortunately, Domain managed to preserve 11 minutes that remind us of a time when absolute evil wore a human face. Eight months later, Hitler's forces suffer a catastrophic defeat at Stalingrad. The war that Hitler's powers of persuasion began ends in suicide in the bowels of his bunker. This tape lives on as a connection with the past and stands forever as a warning for the future.